As I look out over the audience, I'm reminded of something Adley Stevenson said at the 1960 Democratic Convention, because even though he was trying to get nominated, he wasn't an announced candidate, so he walked onto the floor of the convention, and he got completely mobbed. And as he left, a television commentator said to him, uh, who do you think is going to win? He said, the last survivor. Uh, <laughs> so I want to welcome you all as the last survivors. <laughs> uh, uh, look, I'm honored to be here with two of the most vital and insightful public intellectuals in America, uh, whom I read all the time. Uh, Ann Applebaum is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian, writer for The Atlantic, senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Her latest book is, quote, The Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. By the way, when I recall a lot of the book titles that we've heard about during this festival, I'm tempted to think that there's more than a little pessimism here about the future. Uh, Ezra Klein is a columnist for the New York Times, where he also hosts the Ezra Klein podcast. At a young age, he has a storied career in journalism and as a commentator. His New York Times bestseller is entitled, Why We're Polarized, another optimistic take on where we are in America. <laughs> Let me start with this, and, and I guess I'll start with you, Ezra. Uh, how polarized are we? How did we get here? And has the polarization ever been this serious and this dangerous in modern times? Ah, nice, easy question for 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all for having me. One of the tricky things about talking about polarization is you have to always ask, polarized over what? It's a word we tend to use in the singular when it can mean many different things. So are we more polarized than ever? More polarized over what? Compared to 10 years ago, compared to 2012, say, we're less polarized on economics. If you go back to the period where Paul Ryan and his budget are dominating the discussion and you, know, you have Barack Obama and you're soon to have the rise of Bernie Sanders, economics was splitting the parties dramatically, right? One party wanted to privatize Medicare, the other party wanted to you know, expand universal health insurance. That's eased a lot. We're less polarized on economics, on trade, on a bunch of different things where the possibility of compromise of unusual bipartisan coalitions has actually gone up. On the other hand, we have fallen down what I like to think of as Maslow's hierarchy of political needs. We're much more polarized over whether we should have elections or whether or not the rules of the American political system should be followed. So we've become, I think, polarized at the level of system more even than the level of policy. We used to more or less agree on the system, but there were very deep divisions about the policy. But now the system is what is under uh, uh, under attack, the Republicans have become a much more anti-system party, not just the political system, but you know, much more, I mean, they've always obviously been skeptical of what would get called the mainstream media, i.e. me, but they are much more intensely skeptical of that, of universities. They've turned more on business. You can see Ron DeSantis going into going to war with Disney. That's not the kind of thing you saw from the Republican Party 15 or 20 years ago. The Democratic Party has become even more of a pro-system party. It has become sort of more establishment oriented, more frankly connected to business than it used to be. And so in a way, yes, like I think we are much more polarized. We are more polarized fundamentally, but not more polarized in every respect. In some ways, it's a less policy oriented debate right now and more of a debate over what kind of country and what kind of system we're going to be. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, would, I would say, uh, though, that the reason why this kind of polarization feels more dangerous and also feels different to a lot of people, probably in this room, um, is that it's, uh, it's, an, it's, it's about something much more existential. You know, an argument over how high taxes should be. I mean, people feel very strongly about it. Some people think it's, you know, the most important issue in America. Um, you know, it's crucial to their businesses. But it's not about their identity or the definition of who they are and who the nation is. Um, whereas arguments over the nature of democracy and you know, uh, you know, who won the election in 2020 and is, you know, is there an elaborate conspiracy theory about it, these are really existential questions that reach to the, the heart of you know, what it means to be American. 
Um, and that's why these kinds of arguments are so much harder to solve. I mean, when you, have a, when you disagree about taxes, you can get everybody in a room and you can have an argument about taxes. Maybe it's a bitter argument, but people probably won't kill each other at the end of it. Um, if you disagree about what America is and you get everybody in a room and argue about that, you could have people killing each other. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's actually, that insight even comes from, uh, you know, when you, I, I, a couple of years ago, I wrote something uh, where I went and spoke to people who had worked in post-conflict zones, you know, after civil wars. Um, and I also, in particular, I talked to somebody who'd worked in Northern Ireland. You know, when they were, when they finished the sort of formal Northern Irish peace process, then there was an attempt to get communities to reconcile in Northern Ireland, where there had been a lot of violence, where you know, people literally lived on different sides of walls. You know, how do you bring people like that together? And one of the things they tried to do is they tried to bring people together, again, to talk about where should the road be and what kind of bridges should we build? And should we have a you know, youth community center in, you know, on this street or on that street? And who should be in charge of building it? And again, those can be controversial things. You know, nobody wants the bridge going by their house or they want the road to be somewhere else. And they can be angry at it, but they're unlikely to murder each other. <laughs> Whereas if you have people arguing over, is this state you know, Protestant or is this state Catholic? You know, or is it British or is it Irish? people will kill each other. And so the, the reason why our polarization feels so bad now is that, is that from policy differences, you know, differences about you know, money and maybe money, maybe property, maybe even social issues, we've moved on to these existential differences and that's much more bitter and angry. Yeah, that, that, that's very interesting because if you think back to the Obama administration and take your example of taxes, uh, yeah, the deep disagreement about what to do, uh, and Mitch McConnell and Obama, Biden was negotiating the deal, actually came to a place in the middle where for a certain group of people, the tax cuts were extended, for other groups of people, they weren't. There was uh, extra unemployment compensation for folks who were out of work. Those aren't existential questions. They may be very important in people's lives, they're not existential. I think the fact that that what you're citing is uh, raises a whole host of questions, and I'm gonna start with, with this. To what extent uh, does race uh, and then the alienation of so many Americans in the face of vast cultural and demographic change and the loss of civic education drive this kind of systemic polarization that you're talking about? So, let me take this in a couple pieces. I'm not a believer that the loss of civic education is a big player here. I think that's something people always want to hear, that if we just had better civic education classes, we could prevent this from happening. I don't buy it. Um, when I think of what I didn't talk about enough in Why We're Polarized, which comes out in, in 2020, and which you should all buy and, and does in every other way, <laughs> explain our current For sale, situation right after perfectly. the right. Um, that book does talk a lot about racial polarization. It talks a lot about the polarization driven by high immigration numbers. It talks a lot about the polarization driven by um, changing religion. And I think something that is crucial, inextricable from the current moment, is that in each of these measures, we have seen society changing at a rapid rate. Right? We are on path to become a majority minority country. People argue about what that means, but the fact that we will not have the kind of stable demographic power sitting with white Americans that we have for the entirety of American history has destabilized American politics, right? I think it is for the better, but it is nevertheless destabilizing. I think people underestimate how big of a player religion is here. There is no Donald Trump. There is no Donald Trump without his unbelievably intense support among evangelical Christians. And the fact of the matter is that if you look at the lines for when we're become, gonna become a majority minority country racially, which gets a lot of attention, it's very similar for religion. Um, when do Protestants no longer have a, Protestant Christians no longer have a, a majority in this country? Same chart, you know, it happens around 2040. The Democratic Party is itself now the most popular religious answer in it is no organized religion. Democratic parties become a, 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 I don't want to call it a secular coalition because many of those people are spiritual, but it is nevertheless a, a non-religious coalition the way it used to be. But to, to the question you were asking a second ago, one of the big surprises of the past four years has been a slight but nevertheless real drop in what we would call racial polarization. The reason 
Joe Biden wins in 2020 is not that what Donald Trump does between 2016 and 2020 alienates him even more from black and Hispanic voters. He wins more black and Hispanic voters. What happened is he alienated himself from somewhat uh, from some number of white voters, and they went to Joe Biden. So weirdly, the 2020 election sees a slight, slight, but nevertheless meaningful drop in racial polarization. What changes is educational polarization. And I don't, I think educational polarization is tricky because it's not just tracking education, it's tracking some referent of what we would call, in my opinion, class. Some referent of what it means to be on the inside of American life, uh, and not life, some reference of what it means to be on the inside of American momentum, on the inside of prosperity, and on the outside of it. But Trump begins winning, and the Republican Party begins winning larger numbers of non-college white people. That's been happening for a long time, and I think is driven by race, or was for quite some time. But also uh, black Americans, also Hispanic Americans, and the Democratic Party is winning college-educated Americans in numbers it has never seen before. The reason it holds on the way it does in 2022 is it wins college-educated Americans. And so I do think one of the pieces of polarization that often gets missed is this kind of um, class polarization, not simply a money polarization, not material. Democrats win voters making less than $100,000, even now. But there is something about whatever is getting picked up around education that has begun to flip. This Democratic Party that used to win, um, that was always called the party of the working class, right, that, that won non-college voters, it doesn't win them anymore. The Republican Party does. And that helps explain, I think, a lot of how our politics look. The fact that the Democratic Party, as a piece I, I published today in the Times talks about, is sort of simultaneously a party where some factions of it want great change, but it's also a party arguing for stability arguing that, you know, actually America's kind of already great. We don't want to change it too much. We don't want to burn too much down. And there are things that the Republican Party is doing, aesthetics it has adopted, the dynamic of Donald Trump, the kind of WWE dynamic of Donald Trump that is sending cultural signals that the Democratic Party doesn't even understand how to send or even really how to interpret anymore. So I think that this dimension of class polarization, the ins and the outs, rural city, this has become very, very, very important, and we have less language for talking about it, but it is a kind of polarization growing fastest in our elections. Is, this is actually a question for you. I mean, uh, is it also what we're seeing a revolt against meritocracy or the idea of it? Um, you, know, you know, a lot of things in America up until pretty recently were decided not really by meritocracy, but by inheritance. You know, you you know, there was a kind of, you know, Protestant elite on the East Coast and their kids went to Andover and Yale and, um, you know, everybody kind of accepted that and, you know, I, if you're from the Midwest, you didn't really think about Andover and Yale and also you didn't really care about Andover and Yale. You know, you had your own University of Michigan or you had your own, you know, farming community and, and that was your, I mean, there's almost a way in which the expansion of, and I'm just thinking out loud, I'm not saying this is necessarily true, you know, the, 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 the universities opening up to more people, um, allowing people from all over the country to apply, which is a, obviously a good thing, also created the feeling, it changed a little bit the nature of who is the elite or who are the leaders in the country, and it made them feel not like, you know, it wasn't, of course inheritance still matters and you know, your family still matters, but there's also a sense that people have that we deserve to be here. You know, not just because daddy owned, you know, a bank, but because I worked hard and I did really well in my SATs and therefore I deserve to be whatever it is that I am. And it also meant that people who didn't get into that stream felt they were, you know, lesser, right? They couldn't compete or they didn't have good SATs and, and they didn't get in. And I don't think this explains everything, but there is a, there is a way in which the, the nature of the sort of so-called ruling class or what is perceived to be the ruling class changed. It became much more pleased with itself and certain that it deserved, you know, deserved something. And also the opposition to it, the, the resentment of it grew. Um, you know, I, I mean, were people 100 years ago really resentful of Ivy League universities? I mean, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, you know, I, don't, I don't remember the, the sort of hatred and dislike of them being so focused and being so much a part of the news every day. I mean, I went to one. Um, and I don't remember worrying about whether stuff I did there or things that were happening there were gonna show up the next day on the cover of newspapers. But now they do, I have a, 
a child who also went to one, and he said, you know, the, the special thing about an Ivy League university is that something happens there, and you know, the next day it's in the New York Times. Um, and somehow that, that dynamic began to play inside American culture, and I wonder if that's not close to what you're saying. It's an, it's an interesting question. I mean, the hard thing here, and, and this really is what my book is about, is that there is so many feedback loops happening simultaneously that unwinding them is difficult. So, so, here's, an, so here's like another cut at that. I actually think the rule, the, what gets called the ruling class, the, I thought it was so funny, The Atlantic had a piece where, where Anne works and where my wife works. There was like, the ruling class is giving up on marriage. I'm like, The Atlantic is the ruling class. <laughs> <laughs> but, but whatever. Um, the ruling class had more power. It lost power. I actually think in a lot of these things, what happened is the stability of a power structure broke. And when that breaks, it's very destabilizing. And I'm not saying it's better when it did. But this kind of politics, as you know much better than I do, the Trumpist politics, this populist right politics, it's very old. It is very old. It shows up again and again and again and again through history. It shows up in all kinds of different countries. I was going to say it's international. It's not. It's, it's not international. To America. Yeah. The thing was that the power structure in American politics was capable of suppressing this dimension of politics for a very long time. So, um, a political scientists would sometimes show you this chart, and these are based on big surveys. But it basically shows that if you look at where voters are there are always this huge number of voters clustered in socially conservative, economically liberal, the, the socially conservative, economically liberal quadrant, right? Not exactly liberal, but basically wants a social welfare state for them, right? Government hands off my Medicare, but don't give it to the undesirables, but also does not want things changing in the culture too much. But that sort of politics was not well represented, and when it tried to emerge, it would be squashed down. Pat Buchanan in the Republican primaries, Ross Perot running as an independent. And this was a time when parties, and, and Bob would know this history much better than, than I would, there's a time when parties, I mean, they had a lot more power at their conventions. Parties had a lot more power to structure primaries. They had a lot more power to structure who came up. They controlled more of the money. They controlled more of the information. And that power, the ruling class somehow becomes most visible when it becomes weakest. Because when it becomes weakest, it can't actually stop challenges in the way it could before. So that, to me, is one dimension of this. A lot of the cracks in the system become more legible. And then you begin talking a lot about the ruling class. But the political parties are not more powerful than they were in 1990. They are much less powerful. They have much less capability of structuring anything. A more powerful Republican Party would have stopped Donald Trump. He never would have gotten to where he got to. But he could only get to where he did because that power structure was breaking down, um, not that it was becoming more entrenched. The only other thing I'll say quickly is that one dimension of, of the, the sort of analysis I try to build in that book is about media and culture. And as particularly the, the digital age, starting with cable going up through the internet, allowed for this incredible profusion of niche culture, this breakdown of mass culture. And what that meant is that people got much better at sorting. Um, the cultures became more different from each other. So one thing I do think bega that, that began to happen in this period is that there, be there opened up larger gaps uh, between like the different cultural subgroups in America. And they began to notice that about each other. They felt they could see each other better because they were all on the internet, they were all on cable, but they began to feel like they knew each other less. This is a period when you'll see like New York Times maps about like this part of the country wa watches Duck Dynasty, but this part watches The Sopranos, right? As the culture became broader, the fact that we were more distant from each other became more salient. And then the uh, opportunity for a politician or a set of politicians to become hyper appealing to a part of the culture that the other side didn't understand at all, mixed with the inability of the party structures to stop them, I think created the sort of politics we have here. You, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think there's some false consciousness here. That, that oh, Marxist. As people, as people <laughs> no, Herbert Marcuse. Uh, <laughs> as, people, Mar as people sort themselves out, we've lost, and I said this in, in another session, we've lost Daniel Patrick Moynihan's old adage that everybody's entitled to their own opinions, but not their own facts. And one of the interesting things that's emerging in the, the exit polls or entry polls in the case of Iowa is that the issue of immigration and illegal immigration seems to be more powerful as in states that are farthest from the borders. Mm. 
that all has to be fed by social media. I mean, there isn't a huge influx of migrants into New Hampshire. But that, that's, not, that's not unique to the United States. So the, the, the political leader in Europe who made the, who put immigration at the center of his campaign, who ran on it you know, time and again, who did posters and advertising campaigns around his country, warning of the dangers of illegal immigration was Viktor Orban, the, the prime minister of Hungary. Um, Hungary has no immigration. I mean, maybe a tiny bit, maybe here and there. Actually, in the 90s, they had a few immigrants from Bosnia because of the Bosnian war, some of whom were Muslims, and they all integrated and settled perfectly fine. Like, there's no historic history of, you know, problems with immigration in Hungary. You know, nevertheless, he was able to make that, to put it at the center of politics. By contrast, Greece, where actually they do have a real immigration problem, meaning that people take boats from Libya and they land the boats on Greek islands and then someone has to do something with them. I mean, they have to be fed and housed and a program has to be set up for them and they have to be processed somehow. And, you know, and it's, you know, even with the best of will, it's a, it costs money, it's a problem, you know, it's, a, it's something that, you know, local inhabitants have to, have to cope with. And yet Greece has not had a wave of massive, you know, so far, massive anti-immigration sentiment. Um, I also once worked on a project that tracked, was to do with tracking coverage of immigration in Italy. Um, I was working with another group. And one of the things we found was that the, the level of concern and anger over immigration in the press had nothing to do with how many immigrants were coming into the country. So, you know, so immigration is clearly, you know, I don't want to say that it's not really about immigration, but it's clearly also about other things. You know, it's about, um, you know, we were talking about this last night. I mean, it's about anxiety about growing diversity. It's about, f you know, feelings of loss of control. You know, in a global economy, you don't have the same control over your life that you, you did, used to or you think you have. Um, you know, the image of someone, you know, uncontrolled masses coming over your border you know, clearly create some anxiety. So, so immigration is a, is a profound and central issue, not only because it's the one the right has chosen to run on in, in so many places, but also because it's clearly, you know, it, it's not necessarily re related to reality. Yeah, Ezra, you, you've written, this is a quote, the American political system, which includes everyone from voters to journalists and the president, is full of rational actors making rational decisions given the incentives they face. We are a collection of functional parts whose efforts combine into a dysfunctional whole. Is there any way to fix this? To set new, and I'm trying to move on to see not just the problems, but is there any way to fix this? To set new and better incentives? The, one, the intention of that thread of the book is to get people to see politics as a system, not the function of individuals. And in particular, to not believe the endless lie we tell that this or that president, this or that senator will fix it. If you want things to be different, you need to change the rules. Um, I think one of the analogies I, I offer is that you know, on one level, like the people who play football in the NFL are friends with each other. Right? They know each other, they maybe played with each other on a team before, and then the whistle blows and they run at each other wearing armor as hard as they can in a way that they know causes brain injury. And if somebody like raises his hand is like, I think we should not tackle anymore, they will just be replaced with somebody who does tackle. <laughs> if you don't want people to hit each other in the head and cause brain injury, you have to change the rules. Um, there's a lot we could do. I think we could literally just get rid of political primaries. You could certainly structure political primaries dramatically differently. Um, and I think that you uh, should. How? Well, you could, you could, for one thing, open them up, right? Political primaries could be open voting on both sides. They could have ranked choice voting, right? But they also, political primaries are very strange. Because to a first approximation, nobody votes in them, right? The number of, the percentage of Iowa Republicans who voted in the Iowa caucus, not exactly a primary, if I'm not misremembering this, was 7%? Yeah. 7%. So 7% of Republicans in Iowa, which is small, I'm from California, you're all in California, 7% of Republicans in Iowa dramatically shape 
the choice that everybody will end up having in November, right? Who wins in Iowa is the first and most important question for who wins a Republican primary. Add in New Hampshire, you're talking about 47 people and three dogs. And like, that ends up deciding who like, we vote for. So primaries have this quality of putting this incredible leverage point on a very small fraction of the parties who then choose people who are out of step oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, with the, the broader population. It's one reason I sort of miss when conventions had a real role, because they had a much broader set of interests and dynamics coming in. It's one reason I often prefer the parliamentary systems where parties are making more of the decisions. So like that's a space of leverage. The filibuster is a space of leverage, right? I, I won't go into this. I will bore you guys forever with this if I do. But the filibuster makes compromise less likely in the Senate, not more likely. If you know you can, you can kill maybe, a bill. If you can him. kill a bill, that is often better for you than compromising on a bill. If you can't kill bills, compromising might be better for you than ineffectually voting no over and over and over again. There are a lot of things you could do to alter the structure of American politics that might help. Now, it wouldn't necessarily end these challenges altogether. Something that I think is, is a consistent thing you need to keep in mind that Anne's work is so important for is these dynamics are international. They recur across political systems with different internal rules and structures. But how your political system works does matter and you could do more with that. So the issue is you can actually do a lot with structure. The problem is because politics is very closely divided, you can't get any leverage on structure. The way things usually work is you actually need much more than a majority to change structural rules in American politics, change the Constitution, change the rules of the Senate, et cetera. And that is very, very, very difficult to attain. So on the one hand, I can give you my laundry list of, of things you could do. And on the other hand, in a world where you had the power to do them, they wouldn't be as necessary. Do you know what I mean? Yes. That if we had the functional political system that could get together and be like, you know, the electoral college is the word I'm looking stupid. The electoral <laughs> college is stupid and now tends to serve the precise opposite purpose it was what meant to say? serve. Of getting, like, the electoral college is meant to be the thing where a bunch of elites would get together and say, are you kidding me? Like, Donald Trump is president? Absolutely not. Instead, it's the reason he wins. But you can't get that because the Electoral College benefits one of the two parties. So you have this sort of recursive problem, like you can solve, you have a problem of structure and because you have a problem of structure, you can't solve a structural problem. I, I want to pick up on two things you just said, then uh, uh, throw a question to Anne. Uh, it, you talked about regretting the declining power of conventions, uh, national political conventions. And it occurs to me that that happened because of another period of polarization in recent history, and that was over the Vietnam War. Yeah. And you had a Democratic convention in How Chicago. How Gary Hart destroyed American politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and I was a young person hoping to do it too, uh, young then. Uh, well, hoping to destroy American politics <laughs> Well, <too>. no, <laughs> hoping to destroy a convention system that could clearly frustrate the will of a majority of Democrats and the result of that was that you had a commission and the Republican Party ultimately followed this. You had a commission that said, the voters are gonna pick the candidates, the party bosses are not gonna pick the candidates. Uh, and I agree with you, without that change, you wouldn't have had Donald Trump. But I also think that without that change, you wouldn't have had Barack Obama. Uh, so it, 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 there are two yeah. sides of the coin. The other thing you said that's very intriguing is that this is not just a, a problem in America, that there, these are bigger problems. So what I want to address to Anne, because she, she's written so persistently and so elegantly about this, uh, Senate Democrats uh, and Republicans, along with President Biden, have negotiated a deal, it's a rather odd deal, that ties aid to Ukraine with making the border more secure. Uh, they're about to announce it. Uh, the Speaker of the House says this is a non-starter for Republicans in that body. Why can't they take yes for an answer on border security? And what does it say about the prospects for progress on hot button issues? And does it suggest that somehow or other America in this polarized era is becoming more isolationist? That we're going back to the 30s? You know, so one of the um, 
you know, one, one of the, I think, problems the Democratic Party has, not just the Democratic Party, actually, because it's a broader coalition, but people who believe democracy is under threat in America, which includes Republicans and independents as well. One of the problems that they have is it's very hard for them to express to people what it is they're afraid of. I mean, if you tell Americans, oh, you know, it's gonna be Nazi Germany, really, I mean, nobody believes you. You know, it's clearly not gonna be Nazi Germany, you know. But, but there are already, I think, in public life, beginning to be manifestations of what a, um, you know, what, what real dis political dysfunctionality in the United States would look like. And actually, this bill is one of them. So, you know, what if we get to a point where the United States is unable to take important decisions, you know, um, where in an emergency, in a military emergency or in a political emergency, we aren't able to come together as a nation, you know, and, and, and make a decision. Um, you know, what if the, the interests of a, of a minority, actually, of um, people who don't care about democracy, who prefer dictatorships, who, who have a different vision of the United States, are able to block the majority. Um, and that's, the, the, the beginnings of that are what you're seeing in this process. So for those of you who don't know, um, last summer there was meant to be a spending bill that would have included aid to Ukraine, and had that passed, which there was a majority in both houses of Congress in favor of passing it, um, we wouldn't even be talking about this. And, I, and actually, up until that moment, I, n I didn't think there was gonna be any trouble with spending for Ukraine. I mean, why should there be? It's, it was supported by the White House, by Congress, by the public, everybody. And it's what, overwhelmingly in the public interest. Overwhelmingly in the public interest. And then the, what happened was, is Kevin McCarthy, under pressure from his far right, um, in, his con in his party, dropped it off the bill and did a sort of private deal with the White House where they agreed they would pass it later, is it separately. Um, what happened, we, we know, or those of you who you know, bother to follow the saga of Washington know, is that Kevin McCarthy immediately lost his job. He was replaced by Mike Johnson. Um, Mike Johnson more clearly comes from this minority faction inside the party, and they decided to play politics with this money. So they said, you know, we don't want to just give the president this, you know, this money and solve the problem. We want to bring in these issues of the border. And so they had this idea that we can't pass Ukraine aid unless we solve the border, by which they didn't only mean giving funding for, you know, border guards and, and processes and so on, but also changing the rules for asylum and parole and so on. This is an unbelievably difficult um, set of issues to solve, you know. You know, it's, it's very hard to know if you change the rules of asylum, how you're gonna affect people and how that's gonna change. You know, and it's, anyway, they spent months arguing about it. And what's happened now is that the Senate is finally ready, having been given this impossible task of creating a bill that encompasses these two radically different things, you know, aid for Ukraine and money for the changes to the border law with additional some money for Israel too. Um, they've, they've now created this thing and now suddenly um, because Trump is, appears to be the candidate, and because he influences Johnson and calls him on the phone, now suddenly Johnson doesn't, doesn't want to pass it because that might solve the border problem or appear to solve it. Um, and that would then give Biden a victory, and that might be bad for the Trump campaign. And so what you have now is a minority of Republicans who don't really even want to govern anymore. So their interest is all this, propaganda and discussion and conversation about the border, some, some of it real, based on real stuff and some of it not, turns out to be, you know, um, a kind of fiction. I mean, they don't actually want to solve it. They want to, uh, they want to talk about it, they want to have it as an issue, they want it to be the thing they're going to run on, you know, next autumn, um, you know, and the opportunity to solve it, even if it's just to partially solve it, they're about to to, to give away. And the consequences of this um, for the US and for its, uh, the perception of the US in the world are going to be extraordinary if we don't pass it. So it will mean the US has abandoned an ally for whom it created this massive international um, coalition. You know, Biden was the leader of a 50 country coalition that was giving aid to Ukraine. Um, you know, uh, he, he, he pulled it together almost miraculously, you know, as after the invasion began. Um, he personally went to Kiev. He's given two major speeches in Warsaw about the significance of Ukraine. 
and suddenly it will appear that the autocrats of the world, especially you know, in Russia, who've been describing the United States as degenerate and divided and you know, unable to, uh, you know, will be right. You know, um, and so we will we will fail. Um, you know, the, you know, it could mean the conquest of Ukraine. It could mean the replacement of the Ukrainian government. I and mean, there are all kinds of consequences that could follow if the Ukrainians run out of ammunition. Um, you know, um, you know but Europeans will help, and actually they've given more money to Ukraine than we have. But they don't have the capacity to produce weapons and ammunition that we do. Um, and so the you know we we are at a point where a small group of people whose aims are. Um, you know, political, you know, who are, are in, really in their own political interests rather than in the interests of all Americans are blocking a bill. And that's, that's pretty far down the line in the direction towards, I don't want to say the end of democracy because that's the wrong word, but certainly towards, you know, a, a kind of dysfunction that I don't think we've ever had before. Well, so we can't solve systemic problems. We're polarized over those. We can't deal with policy problems. How much, and, and democracy is in trouble, how much trouble is it in? How much peril does democracy face today? And wh where would you see things 10 years from now? <laughs> I mean, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Look, we are in this election cycle dealing with a level of fundamental threat about what at, w at what level a system can be attacked that is unlike anything, I mean, certainly in my lifetime, I think, frankly, I mean, I, you could make some arguments about Nixon, but I, I don't actually think they're the same anymore. I would have thought this a couple of years ago. I would have thought the Nixon-Trump analogy kind of worked. But think, think about what yeah. happened to Nixon. I mean, Barry Goldwater, exactly. John Rhodes, all the Republican that leaders, go down from the, the, the Congress and say, you gotta, you know, this isn't gonna work, you gotta resign, and Nixon says, well, if I push on to a trial, will you, how will you vote? And Goldwater said, I'll vote to convict you. And that's the thing, I was gonna say that like, in 2016, Donald Trump governed in a coalition government with the Republican Party. In 2020, that Republican Party is gone, right? There's no Paul Ryan speakership, there's a Mike Johnson speakership. And so the, the very, we have a very near-term question and a longer-term question, right? What happens if the bridge builds over the Trump waters, right? What happens if Joe Biden wins 53-47 um, and like that's the end of that? I don't, I mean, look, I was wrong about Trump coming back in 2020, but coming back again in 2024 seems, I'm sorry, 2024. Um, I was wrong about him coming back in 2024, but him coming back in 2028 after losing the popular vote twice in a row feels even less likely to me. At some point, a party does want to win presidential elections again, and you could see things reverting. I do think there's a uniqueness to the particular kind of threat Trump poses, even if you look at the other people who are running this year. Um, but we don't know, because the thing that does worry me is Trump thoroughly infected the Republican Party behind him. And the young... One thing I'm a little, I'm more attentive to these days is what it looks like to be a young person coming up in Republican Party politics. Like, what kinds of things are you reading? What kinds of, the fact that you had all these young campaign staffers who had to get fired this year because there turned out to be Nazi imagery in the meme videos they were making for Ron DeSantis and people like that, that was worrying because I don't think they knew what that imagery was. But it was in the world they were inhabiting online. The kinds of thinkers who have become um, more salient on the Republican side, uh, people like this online writer, Bronze Age Pervert, like that's a real thing, you can look it up. The Atlantic has done a great profile of Bronze Age Pervert because we are all demeaned now having to <laughs> describe reality. <laughs> that, the, what is hap the, I am not sure, for a long time I thought Trump was an isolated kind of threat and as a politician in a way I think he is. But what he is has kind of spread more broadly. And so I don't know. I don't know if this is a kind of temporary threat that America navigates its way past or not. I don't know what Gen Z's politics end up looking like. I mean, there is just a dimension. Look, Donald Trump and the Republicans cannot win without this generation of much older voters. That changes over time, but I'm starting to see a lot of reason to think you're gonna have a more reactionary backlash among young male voters. 
right, the popularity of people like Andrew Tate and to some degree Jordan Peterson, like that should make you wonder a little bit. And you're seeing some, you know, wavering around that in polling. So I don't know, I, I, I find the, both the near term and the slightly longer term very hard to rate in American politics right now. I don't think you should be sanguine. I think that you should expect that democracy and a reasonable political system is something that's gonna have to be fought for and won again, election after election after election. Uh, well, and, sometimes you might lose one of those elections and, and, and then you and might have the last lost. election. But I, <laughs> yeah. it's, I think it's also going to require a lot more public participation than it has up until now. I mean, one of the features of American democracy over the last 20 or 30 years was along with the, the, de the parties also declined as real things. You know, it wasn't just that they're, you know, that they, they were, they weren't, you know, once upon a time, you know, your local political party organized, you know, dances for teenagers and, you know, picnics and so on. I mean, so, but they've also declined as, forms of socializing and real life political engagement. I mean, a friend of mine has this thing about European political parties, you know, the European left, social democrats, emerged out of the trade union movement, which were, that was a real thing. It was a place where people had interests and they met each other and they saw each other. And the European center right actually emerged out of church organizations and church groups, um, the Christian Democrats. Um, and that's gone too. And so now you have these kind of shells of parties. And one of the effects of that is that politics has become rather remote and it's a kind of a thing you think about every four years and you know, it's something that professionals do and ordinary people don't participate. Um, and we may be coming to a moment when that's no good anymore. You know, there will, I mean, alongside your structural changes, I think having um, the Democratic Party think harder about what having people involved means, how to, um, how to create mass participation and energy. Um, we just had an election campaign in Poland that was unexpectedly successful, and one of the reasons it was was because the party ran a series of very big marches, you know, uh, kind of big demonstrations, and they, these were kind of jolly, you know, people had to physically get to Warsaw and, you know, people came and it was fun and, you know, and that was part of what gave, what created this energy around the, around the campaign. And young people liked it and they organized, you know, chants and they participated. And, and the, the Democratic Party may also, or not, to, again, I keep saying the Democratic Party, but I don't mean that. I mean the Democracy Coalition might also have to think about how we're going to get people engaged again. And how do we? Are we going to have marches here? Have, have parties? I don't know. Cookouts? <laughs> you know, what, I didn't think we'd arrive at cookouts no, as the answer. No, no, but that's, what, that's kind of what politics used to also be, is that it, you know, there was a way of, you know, there was a, it was, it, you know, politicians offered people things to do. You know, you could hand out leaflets or you could work on a, on a campaign or you could, you know, I don't know, there, 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 was, there was more public participation than there is now. We have very little time left, but assuming history is accurately written 50 or 100 years from now, how will, how will historians look back on this period? I think it depends what happens. I mean, we are, I, I would not have expected the level of stasis from 2020 to 24. I would not have expected that we would be so unable to turn the page at all. Um, I think in some ways I, w I do put some of that on Biden himself. I think that Biden has such a, whether it is because of what they think he is capable of as a communicator now or the way he chooses to communicate, but they have not reorganized American politics around him and their conflicts. Um, he kind of lets Trump create the energy of American politics. I, I, I know the Biden team. They're not out there winning the news cycle, right? They're not out there trying to dominate what people are talking about. That has left, that has been on one level an effective political strategy for them because MAGA Republicanism is a very mobilizing force, right? MAGA Republicanism mobilizes Democrats to vote. Democrats did not come out in 2022 because they love Joe Biden. They came out because they fear Donald Trump. That is why they will come out in 2024 also if Donald Trump is, is a nominee. But the cost of that political strategy is that we're frozen, right? We're in the same political dynamic we were four years ago. There are some differences, but not frankly all that many, fewer than I would have thought. It did not shift, you know, when Barack Obama won, four years later, the election was about Barack Obama, right? Whether people liked him and didn't like him, he was such a dominant figure in American politics and some degree in American life. 
Donald Trump made you know, the election about Donald Trump. Joe Biden just kept the election about Donald Trump. You know, I think if Bernie Sanders had won, um, for better or for worse, if he could have won, that election would have then become about socialism and other things. And so at some point a page needs to turn, God willing. Um, if it does, then we'll see. But right now, we're, we're just kind of a little trapped. Like, it feels very Groundhog Day-ish in the worst possible way. And I, and I have to turn the page because we're out of time. See? Thanks to both of you for what was a really terrific Thank discussion. Thank you.